Good morning, everybody. Today I have such an exciting guest that I don't even want to take a lot of time talking uh, because her and I have so much to go through. So let me just invite our guest today in. Okay, first, as per usual, we have to pin the comment. Ooh, there's Tanya. I just found her. Okay, got to pin the comment first and then have her join us. I hope you guys have been well doing fantastic oh there's tanya wait a minute i have requested for her to join live and then we can hi oh that was nice and easy yes <laughs> I'm so happy. Um, let me just greet everyone because I was just like, I just want to have you on and we can just go because I don't want to waste a lot of time just being here myself. Um, everyone, I have Tanya Selvaratnam with me. I The last time she was on our live must have been like a year ago. Um, you know, she is a gender-based violence, gender, you know, equality activist. She is an author. She's all of those things incredible. And today I have her book with me and we will be talking about that but um let's just first catch up with her and see how she's been doing how are you doing i am so happy to be reunited with you it feels so good i have that song right. going through my head <laughs> <laughs> you look fantastic looking fantastic as per usual i see and you are you spotting too. spotting a denim oh always, yes always but... love a denim look and I know that there's a significance behind it. So I just want to talk about that real quick before we talk about anything else, because I feel like it's so important. Yes. Well, I could wear denim every day, but it has a special significance in this month, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. It's the 20th anniversary, but also next Wednesday, April 28th, is Denim Day. And the reason it's called Denim Day, and what they ask people to wear denim, is because a few decades ago in Italy, an 18-year-old girl was raped by her driving instructor, and the rape conviction was overturned because the courts decided that because she was wearing tight denim, there was no way that her rapist could have forcibly gotten the clothes off of her. That is, yeah. Every time I hear things like that, it just makes me realize how much our systems and our laws does very little to protect women. Because if I am reporting that I just got raped and the first thing you say is, that doesn't make sense though. You were wearing jeans. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible. But I'm hoping um, next week to see women wearing their denims and just standing loud and proud in support of women, um, you know, just speaking out um, uh, against violence. Um, and also, Tanya, the last time I, I saw you, we were going into the pandemic and we were speaking about just predictions of how we think and how the world thinks um, gender based violence is going to spike because people were, you know, women and children were locked into their houses with abusers. This was at the beginning. We, we were assuming that would happen. And it did. Yes. I, uh, and we spoke soon after I had written an essay for the New York Times about where can domestic violence victims turn in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to offer resources mm -hmm. and how to spot and stop and prevent this violence. And then sadly, as we've seen over the past year, in fact, domestic violence was spiking all over the world. And the economic disempowerment of women has made them yep. more susceptible to abuse. And so I feel that as we're heading towards hopefully the other side of this pandemic, that we can take this opportunity. And I'm so grateful to you for the platform that you give for this issue of gender-based violence. Because mm -hmm. I believe there's a direct line between patriarchy and violence. And mm -hmm. until we stop it, until we stop this white male supremacist hegemony, yep. we can't like we can't begin to heal. And there's so much healing that needs to be done from this domestic violence, from the violence, from the hate crimes against Asians, and from the pandemic. Yeah, so you said two things, and I'm going to tap into, the, into those two things. The first one was about, you know, economic freedom for women in general. It's just something that we don't really see, and not just in the United States, but across, you know, the globe. Um, because the minute women don't have that economic freedom, it makes them, you know, more, more 
um, open to domestic violence because then you are stripping them away, um, you know, of, of certain things that can make that they can maybe, you know, provide for themselves. And it is such a huge, huge, huge issue happening around the world that women aren't equipped with this economic freedom that they need. And I just personally think that there's so much that needs to be said about that and there's so much that needs to be done about that. Um, you speak about the Asian, since we're speaking about violence, um, you know, the, the Asian hate that has been going on around. I don't, I actually had a live about that and I was speaking to it about it, but I, I just want to, I just want to hear what your, your thoughts and, and your views are as, as a woman of, of color. Yes, as a woman of color and as a brown woman, you know, brown one, woman, absolutely. and I'm of Sri Lankan heritage, one of the hate crimes that happened in New York City right here where I live, uh, it was the attack of a Sri Lankan immigrant. Um, he was beaten up and it just breaks my heart. And the mass shooting that happened at the FedEx facility in Indianapolis, it has not been declared a hate crime yet and it needs to be declared a hate crime because that facility was targeted because it has many Sikh employees. And last night there was a beautiful vigil uh, you can go to solidarityvigil.com to see more information and watch it, to um, express radical love and also interfaith communion. The Sikh community has been so othered in this country and so misunderstood, and, and we need to stand up. Like, I feel an, a wave of Me Too that needs to happen is for mm -hmm. bystanders to be upstanders yeah. and to do intervention training. So, you know, hashtag stop Asian hate. And it's a, it, there's a direct line between the racist language used by those in positions of political power, you know, mm. calling the pandemic the China virus. A whole president, a whole president calling a it that. Former, so, a former, a former. A former, a former. Very, very important to highlight that. I mean, we, we, we went through a phase and don't even want to go into that right now but yeah. tanya i let's let's jump into your book let's just dive into the book you guys let me tell you when i say you need to get your hands on assume nothing i'm not even joking because there's so much in here to just educate us on domestic violence and to just help you maybe um heal and, and, and open up about something that has probably happened to you as well. Tanya, I, I mean, I couldn't put it down for so many reasons. For one, when I look at you, you are a strong, strong woman who, you know, just has so much conviction and, and, and an activist. And so when I think about it, I'm like, we don't think of how strong women can be in abusive relationships as well. Because when people look at you, they don't really think that you would go through it, but you did. Do you want to talk to us about that a little? Yeah, well, I wanted to write the book for all the people that reached out to me to share their stories of intimate violence and mm -hmm. to help other victims and survivors and thrivers um, spot, stop, and prevent intimate partner violence. And also, I wanted people to read the book and get out of their abusive relationships the next day. Been, and the book is full of resources, dozens of organizations that cater to specific communities so that there's like a broad cross-section of help that's out there. And also, it was very important for me to shift the perception of what a victim looks like because mm -hmm. there were so many people who were surprised by what happened to me by the sexual violence, the emotional violence, the coercive control. And there are some very painful things that are hard for me to talk about. But I, mm -hmm. I thought it was important to talk about because even fierce women get abused. Yes. You know, a victim looks like all of us mm -hmm. and perpetrators are of all stripes. It's just that so many people are scared to talk about the abuse they've experienced. And yeah. what's been heartening about the book um, I love that you say you can't put it down because that makes me very happy um, about the writing. <laughs> yeah, but it's also, beautiful. But also that it is, it, it, it is emboldening people to talk about the experiences they've had. Yeah. You know, that, they're, that they're, they're realizing that it's a trauma that we, so many of us have experienced. You know, millions of people experience it before they turn 18. 
So I want high school students to read my book. And, and also, we are a big community, mm -hmm. and we need to heal. And the healing does not come from silence. We have to break through the oppression of silence. So that's why I wrote this book. I, you said something again that I want to tap into because I spoke about how, you know, victims come in different shapes, forms, and sizes, but then so do abusers because your abuser is in fact, is in fact a, a man who is seen in public and, and loved uh, in public. You know, he's, he's a liberal, a, an activist for, for women and a voice. It's so it's, it's so interesting to see that happening because when a whole, um, you know, attorney general of, of New York, this is somebody who, who people look up to. How were you not scared of, of, of coming out and, and, and speaking about that? Um, were you not scared of, of, you know, people rejecting your story? Because I know this about women who have been abused, even though their abusers are probably not, you know, these great people in public. They're always scared of speaking out because for some reason, people never believe women when they come out and say they have been abused. How was your headspace during that time when you decided to finally speak out? My headspace was in survival mode hmm. uh, because I realized that my story coming out was inevitable. When I first was out of the relationship, I had no intention of coming forward. Hmm. I wanted to get on with my life, throw myself into my work, reconnect with my friends. But when I found out that I was part of a pattern, I felt that I had to come forward. And I have found out since the book has come out that I'm even more part of a pattern that goes back at least four decades with him. There's a woman who needed surgery for an injury that he caused. And so I know for sure I did the right thing. Was mm -hmm. I scared? Yes. But I was guided by good fear. There's a mm -hmm. book that I mentioned, The Gift of Fear, by Gavin DeBecker. And I had actually done a security training with people from his team to protect myself when I came forward. And he talks about good fear and bad fear. Mm -hmm. Good fear is that which allows us to look to our intuition to make decisions. Bad fear is that which prevents us from living our best lives and making good decisions. So I knew that I was doing the right thing. So the fear that I had was good fear. I feel that too many people who don't speak out and come forward, I feel like they have irrational fear in their heads. So I hope that the book helps them realize doing the right thing is paramount protecting other women and children and even men is paramount. Mm -hmm. And also that there are organizations who can help you, who can help you craft a safety plan. Because even though abuse is common, every victim is unique. And mm -hmm. so they're getting out of relationship, they're coming forward, they're finding support, mental health counseling is, mm -hmm. it is unique and so that's why it's so important that there are organizations that need our support so that they can support victims and survivors. Oh, there are, there are so many things I want to ask from the book that I probably will even have to ask in person when I see you because it is so mind-blowing because there's the part in the book where you say, I think it's one of the first times that you go on a date with Eric and, you know, he probably jokingly says something about he's going to tap your phone or have people, you know, follow you. And I feel like, again, in abusive relationships, it's small comments like that that are just like in passing that, that, that you let go. I mean, what, what is your feeling in, in that moment, in that split second when, when he says that to you? I'm just like wondering how that feels like. It's so surprising that it's hard to wrap one's head around in the moment. Mm -hmm. But in retrospect, piecing all of those elements together, it paints a very full picture of mm -hmm. abuse that I experienced. Because abuse comes in many forms. You mm -hmm. know, as I've said, it comes in verbal forms, emotional, mm -hmm. digital, mental, physical, financial, so many forms. And we have to name all those different forms so that other people can hopefully avoid them. But um, I, I can't believe what I put up with. I look back at that person mm -hmm. and I feel very far away from her because now I am my strongest self ever. 
I am so grateful for people like you, for the communities around me, for my friends, for my art, for my work. I also know now that I will never put up with abuse again. Absolutely. And I really asked that question because I really wanted for people to know that it's not their fault for, you know, sometimes not seeing the red flags or even sometimes seeing the red flags, but just not knowing how to react to the situation and in the moment, because essentially it is not your fault. And people will ask you, but why didn't you leave? Why didn't you? And it's, that's just not how it, it truly works, you know? Um, but there's something else that I wanted to speak about that you touch on on the book, and it is the sexual violence of it all. Because now this is something that I've noticed whenever I, you know, have these chats or, or, or run into a, a sexual abuse story of people who are in a relationship. Because somehow people seem to think that your partner cannot sexually abuse you because they are your partner. And they forget that even when you are in a relationship with someone, consent is still very much an important part of it. And so when I read that, I was just like, people just need to understand just because you are in a relationship with someone doesn't mean that you own their body and you can just do whatever it is that you want without their consent. And I just wanted to put that out there as well because it is something that you speak about on the book. Yes, you know, I consented to the relationship. I did yeah. not consent to the abuse. Absolutely. And as I've discovered in hearing from other women who were abused by him. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to get too graphic on, on here, but it, it was really horrific physical violence that was inflicted on us in the sexual context, never with our consent. And an important element of consent is asking for it and obtaining it. Because you don't know what kind of trauma you might trigger when you hit somebody out of nowhere. Mm, absolutely. Um, so you, I want to speak just about the, the trauma and healing of it, I guess. I mean, like, what is the aftermath? What is the aftermath of, you know, being a, a victim? And what advice would you have for, you know, other victims of, of abuse? Well, whether you are a victim for a few minutes mm -hmm. in an assault, harassment, or months or years. You know, there are women who stay for decades in abusive relationships because they don't have the support, either the financial support or the community support to get out. No matter how long that abuse lasts, the trauma is a scar that stays with you and that is very difficult to excavate. I'm very grateful that I'm a writer and that I could write my way out of the darkness and there were some very, very dark times. And it's painful for me to recall those dark times, but it was important for me to write about it so that people could have a window into the emotional trauma that continues and that can really stop lives and how important it is to seek out help. So what I say to victims and survivors is to know that you're not alone and you're not crazy to focus on yourself. You are the most important part of the equation and to seek out professional help because we are all wired in particular in different ways and we don't have to go it alone. So there are wonderful organizations out there. You know, the National Domestic Violence Hotline here, there are international organizations. Um, and in fact, you know, maybe we can share later with your audience some of those resources, but there are so many that cater to specific communities. You know, Strong Arts Native Helpline, Ujima for Black Women, Black Women's Blueprint, their Casa de Esperanza, um, the One Love Foundation that teaches healthy relationships for teens and, you know, young people. Um, so many, so many wonderful organizations. Um, so I just want to, you know, say that you know, I am not an expert, but there are experts out there who can help us deal with the trauma and the mental health needs, which are very real. Absolutely. Um, I think this is my last one because um, one of my last questions for you. And we spoke earlier on about bystanders, but now I want to touch on a little bit on um, enablers because there are enablers as well. And you will find that 
sometimes enablers are usually women and this is so important for me to speak about because we just came from women's month and here we are on on this significant month to women again and you find that enablers sometimes can be women why why do you think you know that is i call them the female patriarchs mm. there is such a thing and another wave of me too has to be calling out the enablers and i want to get that started because the abusers don't get get away with the abuse without their enablers and sadly as you mentioned often those enablers are women in my case there were many enablers there was his ex-wife whom i'm sure had a story to tell too but her power was intertwined with his so i feel that a lot of these women are enablers because that man the abuser is powerful talented or rich and he is their conduit to power so it's 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 the hypocrisy it's the bifurcation and it's shocking when you know the names of some of the enablers that were in my story um they are people that i respect for their work but that i know are deeply hypocritical and i think we have to call them out and until we call them out we won't do away with the abuse hmm absolutely um that is such a powerful thing call the enablers out uh call the bystanders out because sitting back and doing nothing is actually doing something you know yes. you are doing a lot to contribute to the abuse and to just contribute to the culture and so once again tanya i want to thank you so much for catching up with me and just always giving your you know your words of of wisdom and we're just learning we just keep on learning from you thank you for the book and thank you for your bravery because that's what it is i mean when you are faced with going up against someone who's so powerful in society it does you know have a, a fear element to it but because you tell your story you allow others to want to be brave and to want to tell their stories as well and to want to survive and and live and so i just want to thank you so 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 much for that i appreciate you thank you so much zozi i appreciate you too thank okay. goddess for all of us thank you so i'm going to tell people where they can get this book um on the stories we will definitely be putting on the link on how you can get your hands on tanya's book trust me you won't want to put it down it is a fantastic um fantastic book written very well um and thank you thank you for joining me tanya bye bye thank you <laughs> thank you Thank you once again everyone for joining us. I just want to remind you once again um that there is a National Denim Day coming and to those of you who did not hear when Tanya told us what that's about it is such a significant month for women it is a significant month for speaking um just about sexual abuse and and abuse against women. Um and so on National Denim Day I would like to see photos of you guys out there just you know sporting your denims putting on your jeans and and showing support um to women who have been victim of abuse who have been you know victims of of sexual abuse it's just so important for us to keep speaking about these issues um and to just keep on putting them out there because the more we put light into them maybe you know one day there will be um a grand scheme of changes so i hope that we do what we can individually to try and and contribute to a rape free world to an abuse free world um for women thank you once again for joining me in this live i hope that you guys have the most fantastic fantastic weekend i will see you again on another live bye